and, and bring you praise. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I wanted to um, share a little story I heard. Um, it kind of has to do with Mother's Day. It's about three men that loved their mom and they wanted to give her a gift. So <clears throat> it's uh, entitled, It's the Thought That Counts. Three sons left home. They went out on their own and they prospered. While getting back together, they discussed the gifts that they were going to give to their elderly mother for Mother's Day. The first said, I built a big house for our mother. The second said, I sent her a Mercedes with a driver. And then the third smiled and said, huh, I've got you both beat. You remember how mom enjoyed reading the Bible? And you know, she can't see very well. So I sent her a remarkable parrot that recites the entire Bible. It took the elders in our church 12 years to teach him. He's like one of a kind. Mama just has to name the chapter and the verse, and the parrot recites it. Amazing. Well, soon afterwards, Mom sent out her letters of thanks. David, she wrote one son, the house you built is so huge. I live in only one room, but I still have to clean the whole house. John, she wrote to the other, I'm too old to travel. I stay most of the time at home, so I rarely use the Mercedes. And that driver is so rude. Dearest Jeffrey, she wrote to her third son, you have the good sense to know what your mother loves. The chicken was delicious. <laughs> anyway. It's the thought that counts, and maybe we won't be getting any gifts for Mother's Day, especially in the, that caliber, but, um, you know, it's, it's fun to, to laugh to, to be in the Lord's house today, and, and you know, the, the most important thing today is that we're worshiping our Almighty God. It says in Psalm 47, how awesome is the Lord Most High, the great King over all the earth. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our king. Sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing praise to him. A psalm of praise. Let's stand together and worship. Sing to our king.
great, great king to worship today. He is sovereign. Redeem your 
He's a great God. Oh, great God of highest heaven, occupy my lonely heart. Own it all and reign supreme, conquer every rebel power. Let no Have love. 
Our Lord is always so faithful. And he is a great God. We are overwhelmed with what a great God he is. Just the other day I was praying and just hit me. I'm entering into God's throne room. We shouldn't take that lightly and not take it for granted that we, sinful people that he has redeemed, can come before his very throne room. We should be overwhelmed by that and seeing of how great he is. I see the work of your hands, galaxies come before you today. Our hearts are open. We want to hear from you. We're so thankful for this opportunity just to, in our small, meager way, to lift up our voices before our almighty God, who is so great, so faithful, who is always. And we're so grateful too, Lord, for all the moms that are represented today, those that we miss that are gone from us, and some that might be hurting today. But we pray that you will uplift their hearts as they're reminded that they're valued and they're loved. 
And I thank you too, Father, for a chance to be together with this wonderful group of people that love you, this body of believers here at Hillside. We thank you for them and praise you for being such a great God. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take a moment to greet each other and to welcome each other into the house of the Lord today. Thanks so much for worshiping today. over here somewhere. I was running around broken hearted I was sinking so fast I couldn't last Falling apart and You could have run away Leaving me there in my shame Leaving me fighting my pain But you made a better way Well, happy Mother's Day, ladies. Mm. I think most of you uh, ladies, uh, when you came in the door, Janine, I think, probably gave you um, one of these uh, devotionals. Uh, I just wanted to point that out. It's just something, I always try to do something on Mother's Day that um, can spiritually feed us and you know, ha have flowers for something tangible and beautiful. And um, this devotional, uh, it something that God just put on my heart. He's been teaching me about extending grace over the last several years. And um, so hopefully this um, devotional uh, will be, uh, it'll resonate. Um, I know it's uh, been an interesting journey for me over the last several years. Um, I do want to take a moment. Uh, inside uh, the journal, there was just a single sheet prayer. So ladies, if, if you have that, I want to take just a moment and I want to pray this prayer. If you want to read it along with me, um, you're welcome to. But I just want to take a quick moment. And it's entitled, A Prayer for a Priceless Gem. Because each one of you ladies are truly a treasure and priceless. 
Thank you. Jesus, I pray for the woman that is holding this prayer in her hands. Your love for her is invaluable. Thank you that you sacrificed your life just for her. I love that you are crazy about her. She's a beautiful, priceless gem. You created her, and you know her intimately. Lord, you know what makes her laugh. You know what makes her heart ache. You know what brings her joy. You know what makes her cheeks sting from the flow of unstoppable tears. You care about what she is experiencing. You care about her sleepless nights. You know what it's like when she feels stressed. Lord, you were so stressed about what you were going to endure at the cross that you sweat blood. And yet, because you love her, you fulfilled your role on this earth just for her. Thank you for this beautiful woman's sacrifices that she makes for her family and for others that you put on her heart. As she reads your word and spends time talking with you, give her your divine strength and energy as she encounters each day. The more she opens herself to you, draw her in and share your secrets with her. Reveal to her what she needs to see through your perspective. Help her to experience you and your character in ways that she's never known before. Please give her peace of mind. Lord, give her freedom. Help her to break through any chains that are binding her and keeping her from you. Lord, please move heaven and earth in the areas where she needs healing. And if she fills a hole in her heart for any reason, I ask that the Holy Spirit would fill that hole completely. Thank you that the Holy Spirit is interceding on her behalf. Help her to see your hand every day, whatever the day unfolds. Lord, you are worthy to be praised. And last but certainly not least, Lord, please take the seeds that she has planted for you and help her to water them with your joy and faith. Thank you, Jesus, in your loving and priceless name. Amen. Each one of you truly is a treasure. And I'm so thankful that you're here this morning. And I hope that your families spoil you rotten today. <laughs> I'd like to introduce uh, Pastor Larry Adams. He's going to be delivering the message this morning. Thank you, Levon. Well, good morning, everybody. And happy Mother's Day to you moms out there. I'm going to raise this up a little bit. Um, I have so many of our friends have shown up today, too. Thank you so much for coming. It's good to see you. And uh, Carla and I have fallen in love with Hillside. We've known Pastor David and his wife Cindy for a long time. And uh, I know they've come to a very difficult decision feeling it's time for them to retire and step aside for a wide variety of reasons. And Lord willing, next week we'll be talking more about that. But they're in Hawaii this week. Can you believe this? With their whole family, all their grandkids, everybody got together. And so he asked me to come, and I told him, one of my jobs is to make sure they are very glad to get you back. So that's what I'll be doing today. <laughs> But thank you for worshiping Jesus like you did this morning, too. You know, all over the world, there are people gathering to worship Christ just like you've been doing. And you can imagine how much it means to him, because most of the world doesn't even pay him the time of day. But to have a, a group of people like this gathering together to sing his praise. Carla and team, thanks for so much for leading us today. And, you know, on this Mother's Day, it's a day of contrast. Uh, for some, this is the highest day of the year for them. You're queen for the day. Your family's all around. Your husband picked you up in a limo to take you to church this morning. <laughs> and you're going to be going out and wine to dine this afternoon and all the good stuff that comes with it. But for others, this is a really tough day. It's a day where maybe it's the first one without mom, and you're having to experience that. Or maybe the reminder that you've always wanted to have children yourself, but for whatever reason couldn't. Or Maybe this is a day where you're reminded, you know, my mom wasn't that great. And so there's a lot of emotions. I know women over the years who said, I just can't go to church on Mother's Day. It's too painful. But for others, it's a great and glorious day. And I just want you to know today, ladies, wherever you are, the Lord is right there with you. And I'm very grateful today, too, for all the moms and grandmas and the difference they make. 
You, know, you might wonder where Mother's Day came from. It really started from the influence of one woman, a lady named Anna Jarvis. She was born in 1864, and she lived through the aftermath of the Civil War, and she watched her mom, Anna Marie Jarvis, and how she ministered in that border state to both troops from the North and the South, and how she ministered to them, and then afterwards, she started a ladies' society to help bring moms together from both sides who had lost so much during the Civil War. Well, in 1905, Anna Jarvis's mom passed away, and she was devastated by that. And she was so impressed by her mom's example, a lady who herself had given up her own career to care for an older husband. She had 11 children of her own, seven of whom died in infancy. She raised four other children in remarkable ways, one of whom was Anna. So when her mom died, she wanted to have a tribute to her mom, and so she started what became the first Mother's Day. The first one was held in 1908 in Grafton, West Virginia, where she lived. Later, she carried on that tradition when she moved to Philadelphia, and then on May 8, 1914, so impacted by the thought of a Mother's Day, the United States Congress set aside the second Sunday in May every year to be observed as Mother's Day. So for the last 110 years, through Anna Jarvis's influence, moms have been honored all over the country, and that's why we're so glad to be here honoring you today. You know, I was, uh, I was reading a little survey that was done amongst elementary school kids, and they were asked four questions. Why did God make mothers? How did God make mothers? What ingredients are mothers made of? And why did God give you your mother and not some other mom? And so they polled these kids. Listen to just some of these answers. Why did God make mothers? She's the only one who knows where the scotch tape is. <laughs> Mostly to clean the house. God made moms to get us out of there when we were getting born. <laughs> How did God make mothers? He used dirt just like for the rest of us. He used magic, plus superpowers, and a lot of stirring. God made my mom just the same like he made me. He just used bigger parts. <laughs> what ingredients are mothers made of? God makes mothers out of clouds and angel hair and everything nice in the world, and also one little dab of mean. <laughs> they had to get their start from men's bones. Then they mostly use string, I think. <laughs> Why did God give, your mother, give you your mother and not some other mom? Because we're related. <laughs> <laughs> and this one kid said, God knew she'd like me a whole lot more than the other moms like me. <laughs> How'd you like to have that kid? Well, whatever your situation today, I hope it is a good Mother's Day. If you have your Bible, I'd like you to turn to me, if you would, to the book of Second. Timothy. You know, the older I get, more and more of my mentors are in heaven, and so you find yourself coming back to have your mentors be the very people who live well for God in the scriptures. Many people believe this is the last letter Paul ever wrote, and he wrote it to his dear son in the faith, Timothy, who by this time is a very influential and strategic pastor in the church at Ephesus. But when he writes 2 Timothy, there's a wide variety of things he's going to address because there's a sense that he knew this would be his last one. But this is how he begins the letter in chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve as my ancestors did, with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. Let's pray together. Father, there's only one that we need to hear from today, and that's you. And there's no one here who needs to hear from you more than me. And I know while it may be Mother's Day and messages like this are about the influence of a godly mom, we are reminded of 
the importance of each of us, moms or dads, whether we're teachers or neighbors or whatever we are, of influencing and impacting the next generation for Christ. So I'm thankful for this Mother's Day. I'm thankful for my own mom, who through many times of hardship raised three boys. And I'm thankful, God, that she came to know you right before she went home. And I'm thankful today for my own wife, Carla, and for my own daughters who are becoming great moms, and my daughter-in-law, great moms themselves, and the many moms represented in this room today and all those who might be listening online. I simply pray, God, that you'll impress upon all of us the strategic importance of how we invest in the next generation. Even if our kids are all grown, even if they're all into adulthood themselves, even if we feel we haven't done a good job or maybe we're just starting out, whatever it is, it's never too late to live our lives in such a way that you can use us to impact the next generation for Christ. And I thank you, God, for this time today. Speak to us, Lord, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, you can be reminded of the godly influence of a mom every time you reach for a bottle of ketchup. I was reading excerpts from the will of Henry J. Hines, you know, the H.J. Hines Company, the 57 varieties and all of that. Listen, I came across a copy of the beginning of his will. Listen to what he wrote as they read his will to his family when he passed. Looking forward to this time when my earthly career will end, I desire to set forth at the very beginning of this will as the most important item in it, a confession of my faith in Jesus Christ as my Savior. I also desire to bear witness to the fact that throughout my life, in which there have been many unusual joys and sorrows, I have been wonderfully sustained by my faith in God through Jesus Christ. This legacy was left me by my consecrated mother, a woman of strong faith, and to it I attribute any success I have attained. What a difference a godly mother or a godly grandma or a godly neighbor or anyone who influences children, what a godly difference they can make. And on this Mother's Day, it's a good opportunity to affirm all women, especially, and those who, who give their lives to impact children to make a difference in the next generation. You know, every mom, grandma, everyone who works with kids, to all of you, 2 Timothy should be a book of great encouragement. It's considered by many, as I said, to be the last letter Paul ever wrote. He addressed it to a young man named Timothy, who was his dear spiritual son in the faith. Timothy went on to become a very influential in the early church, eventually pastor at the church at Ephesus. Can you imagine the influence Timothy had that the apostle John himself in his later years was in Timothy's church? How'd you like to be giving a sermon from the Gospel of John with John sitting in the front row? Tim Timothy came to Christ early in his life, apparently during a preaching campaign by Paul in the city of Lystra where Timothy lived. And he also came to Christ early because of the godly influence of his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice. Timothy had grown up and distinguished himself as a true disciple, and so God called him to pastoral ministry. And in this letter, Paul mentions four major influences that dramatically shaped Timothy's, Timothy's life for Christ. The first was his spiritual friendship and mentoring by Paul. The second was the gift of God's grace that God poured out on Timothy early in his life. Thirdly, his personal discipline and his devotion. Timothy was a man of the book. And fourthly, the godly impact received in his home is seen in the life of his grandmother, Lois, and his mother, Eunice. It all served as an encouraging reminder to his parents and every parent here today of the difference we can make in the lives of those who are of the next generation. Because one of the things Paul reminds us of in this letter is that one of God's choice instruments to shape the next generation for Christ is the impact of a godly mother and godly women. What influence did Timothy's mother Eunice and his grandmother Lois provide that impacted Timothy so powerfully? Well, Paul is very clear in this book to highlight at least two more of them. A grounding in the word of God and a sincere example of what it means to live out faith in Jesus Christ. 
grounding in God's word, a sincere example of faith. Timothy was greatly impacted by a mother who grounded him in the word of God. If you go a little bit further in 2 Timothy, you'll find this in chapter 3 as Paul comes back to talk about Timothy's childhood. And when you get to Timothy chapter 3, verse 10, this is what he writes to him. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings, what kind of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, the persecutions I endured. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted while evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. It was August 17, 1955. It was a Wednesday. I was three years old at the time. Yes, I'm turning 72 this year. I'll save you doing the math. <laughs> but even at three years old, I remember that day in such detail. It's amazing. I was living in Connecticut when Hurricane Diane hit New England. If you can imagine, it dropped 19 inches of rain in a very short amount of time, creating the worst flooding the state of Connecticut has ever seen. I still remember our house being completely surrounded by water, so deep that a three-year-old could not get out. I still remember my dad and my uncle coming up in a canoe to our front door to get us in the canoe, to paddle us to get to higher ground. It rained like I've never seen it before. We stayed in a tobacco barn that was on a hill overlooking the flood. And one of the things I'll never forget as a kid was standing there watching the houses of our neighbors floating past us as they went down the river. Houses whose foundations had crumbled, causing the houses to collapse, become nothing little more than shreds of wood like a raft flowing down the river. Well, let's see. Let's see if we can tighten that up a little bit. Ah. Let me see what I got here. God says, you know what? I don't like that sermon. I'm going to change things around a little bit. We're going to mix up your notes. You know, I think I will, Mike. Thank you. I thought this would work, but I didn't know it was going to tip like that. Thank you. For you who are watching at home, I'm doing my best to make Pastor David look really good, which isn't hard, so he doesn't normally dump his notes all over the floor. Okay. I'll be as surprised as anybody because now my notes are all in a different order, so this ought to be really good. Anyway, I still remember as a three-year-old watching the trauma of these houses floating by from these houses whose foundations has crumbled. And yet, there stood our house, firm on a foundation with the waters beating against the side of it, and it did not move. And early on as a child, I learned the importance of a strong foundation. You know, people are a lot like houses. We have to have a strong foundation, too. We need a solid foundation, a rock on which to build our lives so that when the storms and trials of life hit, and they will, that we're not swept away. We don't fall into sin and are dragged away into the world. It's what Jesus taught, isn't it? Remember in the great Sermon on the Mount? Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? And I'll tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. And therefore, because it's so important to know the true Lord that you call Lord, he said, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine 
and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. You know, you and I hear it all the time, all around the world, getting our news online, in the papers, evening news, wherever we get it. We hear the sound in our neighborhoods, even in our own families. We hear the sound of crashing lives all around us especially as kids who grow into adults with no grounding in God's word are swept away by the tides of the world. It's amazing that Timothy stood firm throughout his life, in part because he had a mom and a grandma who grounded his life on a firm foundation, on God's eternal word. That's why when you get to 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul reminded him in verse 14, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus you have known them Timothy from your infancy John Calvin the great reformer once wrote Timothy was reared in his infancy in such a way that he could suck in godliness along with his mother's milk 16 tells us that Timothy's mom and grandma were, was a Jewish, a Jewish lady married to a Greek man. Presumably, her husband was an unbeliever. But apparently, being a God-fearing Jew, she believed in the importance of hearing, believing, and imparting the word of God, taking seriously the charge that God would have taught her through Moses in Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. When Moses said to a whole generation of Israel, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. You see, his mother Eunice and his grandmother Lois would have been very familiar with passages that you and I have read many, many times. Like Joshua 1, verse 8. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Book of Psalms in Psalm 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, what he does prospers. Or how about that passage from Psalm 119, one, one of the greatest, longest sections that David wrote on all the importance of the word of God. How can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, O Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. It's amazing, isn't it? The first thing Satan does to move a person away from God is move them away from this book. Timothy's mom and grandma knew that. So from the time he was an infant, they were speaking into his life the very word of God. Apparently, his grandma and his mom, they immersed themselves in God's word, which became the foundation that they began to teach to their infant son. And through their influence, later on, when Timothy heard the preaching about Jesus, the fulfillment of all the Old Testament, apparently there at Lystra, when that young boy heard the preaching of, of Paul, he gave his heart to Jesus Christ, influenced 
by the word that had been impacted into his life from his grandmother and his mom. This is the great benefit of a mom who invests her life to be there in her child's formative years and to impress God's word upon the hearts of her children. And it's been a joy for Carla and me to watch our own girls and our daughter-in-law, along with their husbands, to be able to, from an early age to speak that word. What a joy to, to watch our daughter and her husband with these two twin boys from the time they could hold them in their arms after they got them out of the NICU, they every day would be speaking God's word and singing songs and scriptural songs into their hearts already before they can even talk. Quoting scripture, reading Bible stories at home and impacting others through places like Sunday school. Women, moms, grandmas who take the time to give children a firm foundation in God's word are one of God's instrument to impact the child's life for eternity. And I know that many times we feel like, you know what, I didn't do it that well when my kids were younger, or I didn't even know the Lord myself then, or whatever, but it's never too late to start building your own life on that foundation. And whatever age your kids, they might be in their 50s or 60s, it's never too late to begin modeling for them how you believe that the foundation of God's word is essential to every life, and it's never too late to start building upon that foundation. And not only grounded in the word of God, but they also did this. Timothy was greatly impacted by a mother who modeled for him a sincere example of faith. If you go back to 2 Timothy chapter 1, you read this in verse 5. Paul said to him, Timothy, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. You know, the last time Carl and I were back in Ohio watching our little twin boys that Kimmy had, um, our youngest daughter, Kimmy's twins, they were doing something you don't see two-year-olds doing. They each had a Swiffer mop, and they're mopping the hardwood floor. And then they pull two rags out of a bin, and they start wiping the windows and dusting. And they just turned two about a week or so ago. I'm sitting there watching this, and I thought, where in the world do you get two-year-olds to be interested in having their own mop and want to dust and clean windows? <laughs> they got it from watching their parents. They watched mom and dad clean the floors and dust, and they thought, we want to do that. So they got them one mop, and they were fighting over the mop. So they got them two mops. They had one rag, and they fought over the rags, and so now they got two rags. And they're dusting everything. I kid you not, I sat on the floor. They started dusting my hair. Children learn by watching, not just in the things of life, but they also learn what it means to be a disciple. A disciple of Jesus is a reproducing follower of Jesus. A disciple reproduces. There's nothing in the Bible about a person being content just to simply follow Jesus himself. They desire to see the life of Christ in them reproduced in someone else and especially in their children. Because discipleship is more caught than taught. People pick up from the examples they see, especially in children. Kids seek to model what they see, especially as they get older. And as they get older, if what they are told about Jesus is not seen in the match of what they see in the people telling them, they can often breed a disconnect that leads to rebellion and rejection of what they view as hypocrisy. They're told one thing, but they don't see it lived out. Our kids, the generation following us, is desperate for genuine models of Christian devotion that they can trust and imitate. Now, I don't mean to be critical of anyone, and I'm far from perfect myself. Those of you who know me know that. But I have to tell you, today I see behaviors, priorities, I see things going on in so-called Christians that 60 years ago my unsaved parents would have found objectionable. And we can't live in those ways and expect our children to want to adopt what they are seeing if what they're seeing is not really following Jesus wholeheartedly. 
Timothy had a mom and a grandma who gave him an example of sincere faith. In fact, so much so that when Paul wrote back, he said, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded now lives in you also. You know, that word sincere is an interesting one. Uh, it comes from a Greek word called anipokritos, from where we get our word hypocrite. The prefix ana means without, so the word means without hypocrisy. Hypocrisy means to speak from behind a mask. That's what it literally means. In other words, we say one thing and put on this face, but in actuality, we're living something different. The Greek word anipokritos became the word sincere. But our English word sincere also comes from a Latin root. Two words, actually. Sign and sere. Sign, sere. The Latin word for sign means without. Sere means whack. So literally in the Latin, it means without wax. I was reading once a story from, uh, it was in a book by Chuck Swindoll. He was talking about this. People aren't sure if this really happened or if it was legend, but he said it had an influence on people at the time. That It was out of the porcelain and pottery trade that sometimes when these things got fired, they develop hairline cracks. Unscrupulous vendors would rub wax in the cracks to hide them so that they could sell the pots for a higher price. When people bought the pots, they wouldn't know they were cracked until they got them home, put hot liquid in it, or set them out in the sun. Then the wax would run out and they'd see the, they'd see the cracks. The honest vendors, Swindoll was writing, would hang a little tag around the neck of their pottery that said, sign Saray, without wax. The real deal. That phraseology in Latin, sign Saray, became our English word, sincere. So the word sincere, literally means genuine, the real deal, without wax, nothing hidden. What you see is what you get, that kind of idea. This is the sincere example that Timothy saw growing up. Paul said, it lived in your grandmother. It lived in your mom. And I'm persuaded it's now living in you. That word lived is interesting too because it literally means dwelt in. This isn't something Lois and Eunice put on. This wasn't something that Timothy just used for part of the day and then put it on in a different crowd. He wasn't one guy at church and another guy at home. This word lived means it actually dwells in you. It's living out of you now. It's a new you. It's part of who you are. You don't put this on. It's there. And Jesus produces this. It's living in you. What's even more impressive is the environment in which they live that out. As I mentioned, Timothy had a Greek unbelieving dad. Whether he was supportive or not, we don't know. But most Greek dads of the day wanted three things for their son. They wanted their sons to be educated, they wanted their sons to be athletic, and they wanted their sons to have a good business mind. Spirituality was not important for a Greek dad. Yet so influential was Eunice's and Lois's example of their own faith in Jesus that by the time you get to Acts 16, when Paul is on his second missionary journey, he comes back through Lystra, and he hears a report as he's looking for help in his mission. He hears from the believers in Iconium and Lystra. Two towns are all telling him the same thing. If you want help from a guy who's living it out sincerely for Jesus, you need to get this guy Timothy. And so Timothy hooks on with Paul. And from that time on, becomes his mentored and treasured son. But Timothy had already grown to a place of great influence in two cities because of the sincere faith that lived in him. The impact of a life lived in sincere faith. Timothy was the real deal. He was the same in public as he was in private. And there was no conflict between what he taught and what he was living. It was the very life Paul said, God seeks to see in everyone who's a follower of Jesus. That's one of the reasons I love reading the book of Ephesians. I have a lot of favorite books. In fact, most of the time, I'm, my favorite one is the one I'm currently reading. But Ephesians is really different in this respect. It's almost like a manual of real Christianity. When Paul wrote this book, he used the first three chapters to describe to people what a real Christian is. And then in the last three chapters, four, five, and six, he describes how a real Christian lives. 
In the first three chapters, he describes a real Christian simply like this. A real Christian is a person who now has the living Christ living in them. They have died to themselves. Christ is now living out through them. And they cannot be the same now as they were when he wasn't living there. So when you get to the application section, chapters 4, 5, and 6, he begins to, to describe this is how one of those real Christians lives it out. Why we're not surprised, he begins the application section like this in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. He said, as a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. That phrase, live a life worthy, is a very interesting one. If you were to literally translate it, it would read like this. Bring up the beam of the scale. In other words, what Paul was saying in the application section, if Christ really is living in you, then live a life worthy of that calling. In other words, bring up the beam of the scale. You profess that the living Christ is living in you, so now bring up your life to be in balance with your profession. In other words, live it out. That's the word Paul used to describe what was going on in Lois and Eunice and now in Timothy. This reality of a living Christ was living in them. What's doubly encouraging is that God blessed their efforts in a home where dad may have been distant or non-supportive. And I've met a lot of moms over the years who do not have a supportive husband in the things of Jesus. For whatever reason, they married a guy they shouldn't have married, or maybe for whatever reason, they came to Christ and their husband didn't. But whatever it is, they're doing a lot of this on their own. And I've always tried through the years to keep encouraging them because I said it's great if dad is on board with this. But even if he isn't, you need to know about two ladies who impacted a young boy who changed the early church. And she did a lot of it, apparently, on her own. And that's why moms, grandmas, ladies, all who live godly lives before our children, you need to know you can leave a life-changing model that will impact our kids for a lifetime. The impact of a sincere faith lived out before their eyes. And I'll say again, you may feel like today, I didn't do that when I was younger. My kids are all grown. They're not living for Jesus. Listen to me. If they're still breathing, it's not too late for you to demonstrate before their eyes what a living faith really looks like. And you never know how God will use that to reach them even in their adult years. And so many times, it's not just moms, although they are the closest in influence. Sometimes God has to bring along somebody else, some other lady, some other man in the person or in the life of a child to help them to know that they are loved and who God really is and what walking with Jesus looks like. Somebody he'll bring along at a critical time to help impact their lives for Jesus. Some years ago, from a book called Who Switched the Price Tags, written by Tony Campolo. Tony was a, was a professor at the University of Pennsylvania, sociology professor, powerful speaker. I've heard him speak live a couple of times. His illustrations you don't forget. In his book, Who Switched the Price Tags, he was telling about a lady named Miss Thompson who taught a fifth grade class in a public school and about a young boy named Teddy Stallard who was forever changed by her example. This is what Tony Campolo wrote. You know how Jesus talks about the least of these? Teddy Stahl had certainly qualified as one of the least. Disinterested in school, musty, wrinkled clothes, hair never combed, one of those kids in school with a deadpan face, expressionless, sort of a glassy, unfocused stare. And when Miss Thompson spoke to Teddy, he always answered in monosyllables, unattractive, unmotivated, and distant. He was just plain hard to like. Even though his teacher said she loved all in her class the same, down inside she wasn't being completely truthful. Whenever she marked Teddy's papers, she got a certain perverse pleasure out of putting an X next to all the wrong answers. And when she put the F at the top of the paper, she always did it with a flare. She should have known better. She had Teddy's records. And she knew more about him than she wanted to admit. The records read in part like this. First grade, 
Teddy shows promise with his work and attitude, but poor home situation. Second grade, Teddy could do better. Mother is seriously ill. He receives little help at home. Third grade, Teddy is a good boy, but too serious. He is sl a slow learner. His mother died this year. Fourth grade, Teddy is very slow, but well behaved. His father shows no interest. Christmas came and the boys and girls in Miss Thompson's class brought her Christmas presents. They piled the presents on her desk and crowded around to watch her open them. Among the presents was one from Teddy Stallard. She was surprised that he'd brought her a gift, but he had, and Teddy's gift was wrapped in brown paper like from the grocery store and held together with scotch tape. And on the paper were written simply the words for Miss Thompson from Teddy. When she opened Teddy's present, out fell a gaudy rhinestone bracelet with half the stones missing and a bottle of cheap perfume. The other boys and girls began to giggle and smirk over Teddy's gift, but Miss Thompson at least had enough sense to silence them by immediately putting on the bracelet and putting some of the perfume on her wrist, holding her wrist up for the other children. She said, smell this, kids. Doesn't this smell lovely? And the other children, taking their cues from their teacher, readily agreed with oohs and ahs. At the end of the day, when school was over and the other children had left, Teddy lingered behind. He slowly came over to her desk and he said softly, Miss Thompson, Miss Thompson, you smell just like my mother. And her bracelet looks really pretty on you too. I'm glad you like my presents. And when Teddy left, Miss Thompson got down on her knees and she asked God to forgive her for the way she had treated that boy. The next day when the children came to school, they were welcomed by a new teacher. Miss Thompson had become a different person. She was no longer just a teacher. She had become an agent of God. And she knew now the significant role she played in the life of each of her children. She was now a person committed to loving her children and doing things for them that would live on after her. She helped all the children, but especially the slow ones and especially Teddy Stallard. By the end of that same school year, Teddy showed dramatic improvement. He had caught up with most of the other students and even begun to surpass those in his class. Teddy left her fifth grade class and she didn't hear from him for a long, long time. And then one day, she renew, re received a note from him. This is what it said. Dear Miss Thompson, I wanted you to be the first to know. I'll be graduating second in my high school class. Love, Teddy Stallard. Four years later, another note came to her house. Dear Miss Thompson, they just told me I'll be graduating first in my class. I wanted you to be the first to know. The university has not been easy, but I liked it. Love, Teddy Stallard. Four years later, she gets another note from him. Dear Miss Thompson, as of today, I am Theodore Stallard, MD. How about that? I wanted you to be the first to know. I'm getting married next month, the 27th to be exact. I want you to come and sit where my mother was sitting if she were still alive. You're the only family I have now. My dad died last year. Love, Teddy Stallard. Tony Campolo said, Miss Thompson went to the wedding and sat where Teddy's mother would have sat. And she deserved to sit there. Because at a critical time in Teddy's life, she did for him what only a mother could do. She loved him. And for Teddy, that was something he would never forget. Ladies, don't ever underestimate the power of influence that God has given you in any situation. 
to impact the generations who are coming behind us. And sometimes those kids that are the hardest to love are the ones who need it the most. In our homes, in our neighborhoods, in Sunday school, wherever kids are, the opportunity to ground their lives in God's word and to give them a godly example of sincere faith can be used by God to transform a life. I just want you to know today that many times in this world, people who invest their lives in children, especially moms, are not honored as they should be. But I want you to know today that whether you think you've done it well or, or poorly, whether you're just starting out or your kids are all grown, I want to remind you again, it's never too late to be used by God to make a difference. And I thank God for all of you, moms and grandmas and ladies and others who have invested and continue to invest in kids wherever they can be found, in Sunday school, in your neighborhoods, in your own homes, wherever they are. God is using you to make a difference, the influence of a godly woman. And Father, I want to thank you today that the love of God is manifest through people like this. And we are never adequate to the task. Almost every mom, including the ones closest to me, never feel like they're doing a very good job. And even those who have come to see later in life the importance of investing in the next generation feel like their kids are too far moved on, too far from their removal. They, they have no influence. But the prayers of a godly woman are powerful and effective. And as you live out, God, that sincere faith in each of us, as you live out your word in each of us, people around us can see it. And you can use us, God, to make a difference where it counts most. I thank you that you laid on Anna Jarvis's heart 110 years ago to want to be able to honor moms for all the right reasons. For the godly example that she had in her own home. And when her own children were grown, she went on to teach Sunday school for 20 more years to try to impact children the way she had seen her mom do it. I'm really thankful, God, for women like this. Thankful today that whether their hearts are broken or whether their hearts are full of joy, that you're right there to comfort them, guide them, and encourage them. So God, on this Mother's Day, may we hold in high esteem those who, like Lois and Eunice, continue to make a difference, bringing a living hope to these people of the next generation. And I thank you, God, for all of your help. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm not sure exactly how I'm supposed to close. Oh, Kyler, you're coming up. Hey, I just want to say, too, before I leave the platform, I don't want to assume anything. If you're here today and you're hearing me talk about a relationship with Jesus and a sincere faith and all these other things, if you're here today and you're not sure of what that means or you're not even sure of the difference between I go to church and I know Jesus, if you'd like to really know more about having Christ in your life and having the assurance of salvation and his forgiveness and eternal life as a gift and all of those things, Carl and I are going to be hanging around for a while. And Lord willing, I'm supposed to be here next week, not with a Mother's Day message. But if you'd like to talk either today or if you think about it this week and you might like to talk next week, Lord willing, let us know. Because the greatest gift you'll ever give to God or yourself is trusting Jesus Christ as your Savior. It would be a joy to talk to you about that. God bless. Thanks, Kyler. Thank you, Larry. So, um, hello everyone. I'm uh, kind of just following up on uh, last week. I announced we were rebuilding the church directory and uh, just kind of bringing that up again this week. Um, anyone who wants to be part of the church directory, we're not publishing it right away. We're still gathering information. Um, but we have the forms in the back to fill out with your as much information as you're comfortable sharing. Uh, when we ultimately do form a directory, it is just going to be name and phone number, so not all of the information will be in the directory. This is mostly just for the leaders to be able to follow up with people, you know, like for small groups or other events. Um, but regardless, if you're interested in being part of the church directory, please fill one of these out. 
Um, and also, if you don't want to be part of the church directory, that's actually fine too. If you if you would like to fill out the information but not be part of the directory, that is an option. Um, or if you don't want to fill anything out, that's also fine as well. Um, but our, our goal is to be able to um, make sure that we can connect with everybody. We want to make sure nobody falls through the cracks. We want to make sure that everyone's um, well informed and connected. And personally, um, the reason I'm heading this up is because I feel of a strong uh, calling to reach out to people individually and make sure that they feel connected and um, a part of a part of Hillside. So um, yeah, so the forms are on the back table, um, right back there at the back row, and I've got clipboards and everything. So fill out whatever information you're comfortable with, and um, in the future we hopefully are going to have some you know membership classes, um, possibly some baptisms and stuff like that. So if you want to stay connected to you know everyone else in the church who's um, moving forward, we hope that um, you'll give us some information to help keep in touch. And uh, with that, I think Chris has an announcement. Good morning, Hillside. Morning. It's still morning. All right, it's still morning. Good morning. Uh, okay, really quick, I have a follow-up on last week's major cultural question that we were talking about. If we prefer tacos or hamburgers for the upcoming community group, small group uh, kickoff, and I am here to report to you that tacos have won. So we will be having tacos for that. Yeah, we're gonna, we're, yeah, it's, uh, let's talk about that. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna have a um, outdoor event at my house, in my backyard, for those who are interested in joining a small group, or if you're in an existing small group, or you're thinking about what is a small group? And also, I like tacos. This is the night for you to come over have some tacos, fellowship with one another, and we'll talk about what we'll be doing in the upcoming season of community groups. So we would love to see you. Um, there's a little paper out there. I guess you're right, it's not really a barbecue. It, it could be. It, barbecue tacos? Yeah. Uh, we'll figure it out together, and that's what's important. <laughs> so it's this upcoming Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. at my house. You can grab one of these flyers, text me, and I'll send you the info, or you can take a picture of this. It's got the address on it and we'll see you there. Sound good? Yeah. Okay, I also, I also just wanna let you know that the prayer room will be open if anybody wants to pray after church. I or others will be there to pray with you. And other than that, thanks for coming. Uh, God bless you and you are dismissed. <laughs>